NTV Wild Talk in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct. Hello and welcome to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi, coming to you from the Brookhouse International School here in Nairobi. Now, don't we all just love Nat Geo? That is the National Geographic channel that brings us some of the best and most incredible documentaries about wildlife and this planet. And also the Nat Geo magazine that brings us some of the world's best pictures. Well, on this show, I'm going to have the honor and pleasure of speaking to the president and CEO of the National Geographic Society, Gary Nell. But first, have a look at this. And joining me now is Gary Nell, the CEO and President of the National Geographic Society. Such a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, Welcome. Great to be uh, in Kenya. Thank you. Gary, this is actually your first time in Kenya. It's only been a few days, but what sort of a feeling are you getting whilst being here? Well, there's a tremendous energy um, caught up in, um, in, in this, on the streets uh, and of course driving past the national park right in Nairobi is, is quite remarkable. All right, well, you're definitely welcome here. And I've got to say it is a real pleasure having somebody from National Geographic Society right here. You know, when a lot of us think of Nat Geo, as we call it, we associate it with incredible wildlife documentaries, which we get to air on NTV as part of NTV Wild. But uh, Gary, you are the CEO and president of the Nat Geo Society. So what is the difference between the two? Well, uh, we've actually actually created two organizations which share the yellow rectangle of National Geographic. But the commitment and how we work is to promote science, exploration, and storytelling uh, in one path. So we invest in science and what many people, many of your viewers probably don't know is we've given many scientific grants over the years, some 12,000 of those, including many in Kenya. Um, to, of course, famous people like the Leakey family, who, who are very well known. Uh, and we've had an ability to invest in, uh, in locals who can create amazing stories about different topics. Exploration has been another part of those things that we have underwritten. And then, of, then of course, storytelling, like you mentioned. Uh, the assets have been around, first, a magazine that introduced photography for the first time in a magazine to the world, which was revolutionary at the time. In fact, several members of the board of directors resigned in protest because oh. they thought it would dumb down the magazine. Okay. Um, they were wrong. And then, of course, we went into documentary filmmaking and television. And now, of course, through social media, we're reaching more than 700 million people around the world. So wow. it's about having the appropriate distribution points for our content as what we stand for. You know, that, that really is incredible because the kind of work that Nat Geo does really impacts the environment, our wildlife as well. How does that work? I mean, what sort of changes have been made and what has been achieved to essentially change the world through this kind of storytelling? Well, we've uh, really tried to work through three major lenses. Of course, the Geographic was founded in 1888 to diffuse geographic knowledge. And uh, the second president was Alexander Graham Bell, who, who decided to uh, define that as the world and all that's in it. Quite a narrow definition <laughs> yeah. for those of us running an organization trying to make priorities. But what we've done is, is divided that into three lenses. One of them is the human story, uh, which of course goes to, from paleoanthropology 
such as the Leakeys, who have been leaders of that uh, discipline uh, for decades and decades, uh, and uh, all the way through human migrations today, which you know in Kenya very well. Um, and then, of course, we have our changing planet, which is dealing with climate issues. It's dealing with the health of the oceans. It's dealing with all of the issues that are affecting biodiversity on our planet. And then wildlife and wild places, um, which you're, of course, most well know known for. And Kenya is a epicenter of that uh, work and, uh, in many ways, in trying to protect uh, wildlife uh, in the future and we can get into that. Yes, definitely. But Gary, why why is it so critical to tell these stories? Why does Nat Geo have this belief that it is important to show the world what we have and encourage people to explore and discover and then share what they find? There are going to be 9 billion people on this planet by the year 2050. So some 1.2 billion alone on the continent of Africa. There are 80 babies being born in Africa every minute today, according to the United Nations. How are we going to feed these people, uh, house them, provide energy for them, educate them without burning up the planet and everything in it and on it? And I think this is what we have to think about. And this is where conservation has a core role in the future of our planet. We have to find a balanced way to meet all those human needs, but at the same time protect the beautiful world that we are inheriting and we are going to hand off to our children and grandchildren. And do you believe that Nat Geo has succeeded in doing that over the years? Well, I think we've been incredibly successful in, in bringing the conversation uh, up in having a longer term view. We're not the ones to do breaking news. We're not going to tell you necessarily uh, about every flood or every disaster, but we are going to put maybe that flood into a context of climate change, in a context of uh, weather issues, in a context of how people on the ground are adapting over the long term or possible solutions. So it's a way to put into context all of these issues affecting us uh, on the planet. And Gary, what does it take to do this? Because when we watch the documentaries or see the photographs and hear the stories, it really is of the highest quality and just absolutely, you know, incredible to look at and listen to. Well, storytelling is what really moves people. And I grew up in Hollywood, California actually, North Hollywood, California, in the shadow of Universal Studios. And I learned as a young person uh, the power of media, and I think it's actually more powerful than any political leader is going to be. Uh, political leaders, of course, understand that at times and try, try to do good and not so good things with media. But it's really about storytelling, and storytelling at the end of the day, television, for instance, is the most powerful educator ever invented. You know, I ran Sesame Workshop, which some of your viewers may know for Sesame Street. Yes, tell us, but for those who don't know, tell us a little bit about that. Well, this is probably the most famous uh, preschool program, pre-K program uh, around the world, early childhood education. It's focused on let letters and numbers and basic literacy, but also social and emotional learning uh, and science. And it is, it's built a curriculum that has now traveled to many, many dozens and dozens of countries around the world, including local adaptations in places like Nigeria and South Africa. So the, Joan Gans Cooney, who started Sesame Street, uh, said that television is the most powerful teacher ever invented. And it's not a question of whether television was teaching, it's what was it teaching. So we can put good things on or we can put negative uh, stereotypes on, let's say. And in wildlife's case, um, this is an opportunity to educate the public. Educate the public about the dangers uh, that are affecting wildlife through, through overdevelopment, uh, the, the dangers from poaching, the dangers of all of the issues which you're very familiar with. Um, so people will be in informed and take action. You know, you speak about these dangers and it takes me back to my point, really what what does it take to, to put all this out there? I mean, you know, you've got journalists or explorers or, you know, people who work at Nat Geo, investigators. How committed must they be? It must take a lot of time and effort 
to bring this to the fore? Well, they're very committed, and people like Brian Christie, who produced this uh, investigative piece, which I know ran uh, on NTV about the uh, about the ivory trade yeah. and the illegal ivory trade, and putting a GPS device in fake ivory tusks to track them uh, to warlords uh, and then to criminal syndicates in in the Far East. Mm -hmm. Brian is the kind of person who very much is putting his life on the line. This is a guy who actually covered organized crime in Philadelphia back in the U.S. So he yeah. had good training <laughs> right. to, to do this. And uh, these are folks who are involved in human trafficking. They're involved in drug trafficking. They're involved in wildlife trafficking. It's all part of a, a really a marketplace uh, of, of bad things. And, and I think our journalists are are really dedicated to try to expose that so government officials and others can do something about it. And how did you get involved in that uh, National Geographic? Because you did say that you know you worked and w were part of the team that created Sesame Street, but then from that you moved on to Nat Geo. How did that happen? Well, I've always believed in, you know, as I mentioned, this power of education through media. And so that's been pretty much what I've done through my four-decade career <laughs> in media. It's hard to believe. But uh, National Geographic has been involved as a storyteller primarily. Uh, but also as involved in schools and helping uh, delight children and inspire them to become scientists, inspire them to become uh, active with wildlife, for instance, and maybe mini paleontologists, uh, which will grow up and be inspired to help uh, protect the oceans uh, and, and be global. I have a real uh, belief in uh, the fact that all of us on planet Earth pretty much want the same things. You know, we all want to have uh, a better world for our children. We all want to have a roof over our heads, food to eat, be educated. This is a universal goal and having empathy and understanding is something that we can promote um, through the work of National Geographic. How satisfying or challenging has it been for you being at the top of this organization? Well, like any media organization, you know, we have had our challenges in terms of a so-called business model and the print arena as you probably know is undergoing a massive uh, change, a massive disruption through digital applications and we're no different. I think the good news is that we've made a really strong pivot into this digital age, especially through photography, which we're very well known for. And now we're actually the number one Instagram account in the world. Oh, really? With 60 million followers. We're wow. almost catching up with Kim Kardashian, <laughs> but uh, we're not going to rest until we've passed <laughs> sure. her. But, but that just shows you the power of the image, the power, and this is young people mostly yeah. who are uh, tuning us in, so to speak, at Instagram. And why do you think that the power of the image is so powerful? Well, the power of the image, as, as we've seen so many times, you know, in the news recently has been the Afghan girl, which is probably the most uh, seen photograph in our lifetimes. And the, the now woman, Sharbat Gula, who, uh, what, who is the Afghan girl, she has been just uh, deported from Pakistan where she was living in a refugee camp and is back now in Afghanistan being welcomed by the president. But that image of her as a young child uh, in the middle of war told the story of refugees, told the story of rural women in Afghanistan and captured more about connecting with her uh, on a personal level uh, than probably any written piece could ever do. And then, of course, there's images of wildlife, of elephant poaching, uh, that are disturbing images that people in other countries like China and Vietnam, where the ivory uh, import is uh, rampant, uh, need to see. Because uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about where ivory comes from, and many people don't realize that you have to kill an elephant in order to get the ivory. All right, Gary, so much more to discuss, but we've just got to take a quick break. This is NTV Wild Talk coming to you from the Brookhouse International School. I am speaking to the CEO and president of the National Geographic Society, Gary Nell. Plenty more when we return.
Welcome back to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi, coming to you from the Brookhouse International Schools. And my guest on the show is Gary Nell. He is the CEO and President of the National Geographic Society. Gary, so good to have you and your team right here in Kenya, but many must be wondering, what exactly are you actually doing here? Well, we had a meetup of a lot of our explorers. We've actually given more than... And <laughs> there they are now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there goes the school bell, because as I mentioned, we are coming to you from Brookhouse International School, and it's done. So it's break time. We might have a few kids running around, but carry on. Tell us why you're here. Those are our future explorers. So they are. We've actually made more than $42 million in grants in Africa. Um, and 14 million in the last five years. So this, what we think is a, uh, a modest investment of uh, what we have planned for the future. Uh, as I mentioned before, we make a lot of scientific grants. We've made more than 12,000 in our history, which have led to some of the great uh, finds uh, on planet Earth, including what Richard and Eve and uh, and their parents, uh, Lu Lewis and Mary Leakey, did here in Kenya. Uh, the work of uh, others like uh, Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey. Uh, so, so many, uh, so many explorers. So, what we want to find is future leaders who are involved in science and involved in exploration. Uh, and we are funding uh, early career people who need funding. Uh, involved in the sciences, and it's anything from studying ants and termites to uh, li to wild, larger wildlife like lions and elephants to, uh, as I mentioned, paleoanthropologists. So we're trying to uh, recruit, frankly, more people uh, in Africa, and Kenya is like is one of the epicenters, certainly, of um, scientific discovery and important wildlife issues. So this is a, a reason to come here and try to bring people together to tell them about the National Geographic mission and that what they didn't know, probably, that it's much more than simply a media organization. It's actually an investor in, in basic research. Yeah. And how are you doing this recruitment process? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people who are currently watching thinking, wow, I want to get on board. I want to be an explorer, or at least I want to head in that direction. So how's it working? Well, it's working well. I mean, we're just starting on this now. So we've actually rebooted our organization over the last year to provide a much uh, larger uh, set of investments in uh, basic research. And we actually have an office uh, currently being run out of Kigali in Rwanda, but we want to expand that throughout the region to certain capitals like Nairobi to be able to put the word out to uh, students in even in uh, grade school and college and university, uh, but going up to people early in their career who have really big ideas on how we can provide this balance of conservation and dealing with the very real challenges we have for the population here in Kenya and other African countries. You already have an exploration program and you do have several Kenyans that are Nat Geo explorers. Tell us a little bit more about that program. Well, we have set up a, a, what we call seed scale and share. So we have seed funding. Uh, and under our uh, new science uh, head, John, Dr. Jonathan Bailey, who joined us from the ZSL, the Zoological Society of London, who's done a lot of work here actually on wildlife conservation issues, we, we are setting up a seed grant program that will have smaller grants and then go to bigger grants and eventually become projects. Uh, one we're doing now in the Okavango Delta in Angola, in the headwaters, uh, which are under stress from possible development from dams. And if that does get overdeveloped, it, it could put into danger the entire Okavango Delta flowing into mostly Botswana and millions and millions of wildlife uh, affected. So we're doing scientific surveys, we're doing uh, media, we're doing uh, species counts and plant counts to try to map out the region. That's the kind of project we'd like to explore just the way we did with Jane Goodall and the Leakeys and Diane Fossey and many others. You mentioned earlier, Gary, that Kenya is a key place for National Geographic and we know that all too well because a lot of the documentaries that Nat Geo has produced have been filmed right here in Kenya. But the challenge that we've had is that none of them have been broadcast 
in the country that they've been filmed up until now with NTV Wild because Nat Geo is donating these documentaries back to us to air to our viewers. But how important is it, do you think, that Africans tell their own story? We tell the African story. Well, I think it's absolutely important. And, and from my point of view, it's, it's ridiculous that this has been the case, and I understand why, having worked in television for a long time. But when you're in the global television market and you're feeding mostly Europe and Japan and the United States traditionally, uh, it, that's the market that actually provides most of the economics of the television business. So the fact is, is that the African market has not been developed from a, from a business point of view and it has been starved with, from content for these very uh, types of programs that you, you have mentioned. And as, I, as we talk about educating the public, to think that someone could be sitting in Manchester in England or New York City uh, enjoying and understanding the complexities of the wildlife issues in Kenya and people living in Nairobi have no understanding of these same issues or little understanding from being able to view those is something we need to change. And I think National Geographic is going to dedicate itself to making that happen. I think there's no more important thing as part of our nonprofit mission than to be able to provide these stories to people in Kenya who can view the richness and beauty of their own country. That's a contribution that we should be giving back. Well, that's Nat Geo, you're talking about giving back, but what about the people on the ground um, telling their own stories? For example, journalists who are here or filmmakers and photographers, how critical is it that they themselves tell the stories because they really do know much about what's going on. Very, very much so. So it, as you mentioned, there's two pieces of this. One is giving back the stories. The other one is training. And we're doing storytelling boot camps to try to train actual scientists and conservationists on how to inspire people and tell those stories. We think that it's training the trainer, so to speak. We can build that model. Uh, if you want to, you know, the old adage about if you, if you want to more fish, teach, teach them how to fish. Sure. Um, and I think it's the same idea. And we're also doing photo camps. We're even working in the refugee camps up in Kenya uh, to give uh, young people uh, cameras to begin to take photographs and tell stories what life is like in refugee camps so that they can inspire the rest of the world of what that is all about. And I think this kind of visual learning and this capability is, is so appealing to especially the younger generations. And this is something where National Geographic plans to take a much bigger role in helping train people and some of the, some of the work that my colleagues do in telling stories. We should be telling many others and not just keeping this to ourselves. Why do you think it's taken so long to do that? You know, it's a good question. I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with the economics of the business. Um, and frankly, a lot of it was due to the way uh, the world sort of was divided up between, you know, uh, econ economic industrialized nations and so-called third world nations. Um, and uh, these, many, many of these stories were viewed as exotic stories. And now I think we've realized that the world is actually quite small, that we're all sort of interdependent. And for Americans to understand what's happening in Kenya is critically important, just as Kenyans need to understand what's happening in America. And I think that has been one of the benefits, I think, of the digital age, which now brings us all together, literally, uh, within milliseconds around the world. Right. You know, you talked about training and the importance of that, of course. Uh, what does it take for uh, your average Kenyan that's watching this show to get and rise to the standards of Nat Geo? Because I can tell you, Gary, so many people that watch National Geographic are just in awe of the quality. And a lot of them tend to think there's no way unless I have six cameras and, you know, years to get out there and film or experience that I can do this. So what does it take? Well, it takes hard work. You know, there's a very famous uh, music hall in New York City called Carnegie Hall and uh, of course the line how do you get to Carnegie Hall and the answer is practice and more practice so that's really frankly what it's about I mean this is hard work to become a National Geographic photographer uh, these people are brilliant 
much more brilliant than me, they are able to, uh, to, to grow their work, to be able to uh, spend all of the time as a young person. They also had dreams of becoming a national, but they went at it, and they worked hard, and they, they finally got the break they needed. And I think the message to viewers is uh, to follow your passion, uh, whether that's in journalism and photography, uh, as an explorer, as a conservationist, um, and, or, or someone who is into maps, which is also a critical part of telling the future. So these different disciplines is what makes up National Geographic's toolkit, so right, to speak. Right, right. And we're trying to find and invest in new people, in younger people, and, and build really a new generation of people who can uh, be active and eventually become a contributor to National Geographic. Of course, as much as you say that it's important to follow one's passion and to work hard, for many people, um, financing is a big problem. How do you think that can be addressed? Do you have um, any advice on that? Well, we're, as I mentioned, we, are, we have uh, seed funding programs, which are modest, uh, but and we're going to pick the best uh, applications and fund people in Kenya. Uh, who are involved in all those different disciplines I just talked about and we plan to more actively recruit uh, people on the ground here and those will be available at nationalgeographic.org slash grants uh, something that will be up shortly um, and please be a little patient with us but we're <laughs> sure. trying to organize that now so people can have a much a much clearer pipeline into the National Geographic uh, slot. You spoke about the next generation. How critical is it that children and young people learn about the importance of our wildlife and environment and storytelling as well from a young age? Incredibly important. Uh, they are going to be inheriting the earth from us. Um, and it's a challenging world. And we have a lot of issues to confront. The population expansions, as I made, have put tremendous pressures on the planet and everything on it. And I think we need to inspire a next generation of young people, explorers and conservationists who tell stories, who do science. Uh, all can contribute to part of the solution. So we, we feel like we have our own tribe, so to speak, of National Geographic that is global in nature that uh, has the ability to connect people with this passion to help our planet. And I think um, this is where young people, we hope, uh, can join, join up uh, and use us as a jumping off point to do great things in country and around the world. The Kenyans have a lot of, to offer the rest of the world as well because you're living in a, a magical place in many ways that uh, shouldn't be taken for grant. Does National Geographic have any special projects geared towards children and educating them? Yeah, we do. We have a lot of, uh, first of all, we have print materials, but we're trying to create a lot of digital um, kids uh, materials and also for teachers on how to teach some of these lessons and through short vid form videos and as well as maps and that are available free of charge on the nationalgeographic.org website. Um, and uh, anyone in the world has access to them. Nat Geo is, of course, um, a global organization based in the United States. But here in Kenya, you know, um, not everybody gets access to Nat Geo. If you don't have cable TV, you're not going to get to watch Nat Geo, unless our viewers watch NTV Wild, which um, airs documentaries now from Nat Geo. But as NTV Wild Talk, which is an important show that covers wildlife and conservation issues every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. We are trying very hard to bring core issues to the forefront. How is it that we can learn from Nat Geo? We're not making full-on documentaries, but we are covering the same sort of issues. Well, first of all, we're very proud of the work that NTV is doing and, and our fellow Paula Kahumbu, who's doing amazing work here in Kenya. We're very proud of her and uh, her association with us. National Geographic should be used as a convener, you know, and, and this is what I would advise the show to become. It's really a convener of 
different ideas and some of them can be very different ideas about uh, issues around conservation. I, I'm certainly aware of the, of the issue around the, the new train that's been proposed through the National Park. This is the kind of issue though that needs to be discussed in a civic civil dialogue in some ways, bringing together different people with different ideas to try to go at some of these really tough issues that we have to face and with environmental issues and others. And this is what we're trying to do with the geographic. We try not to demonize. We try to take a lo much longer term view of impacts uh, and what these will be. And again, we think about that balance of providing energy, provide housing, pro providing food, providing education. We can't ignore these things. You know, with any energy use, for instance, there are trade-offs. There are trade-offs even to wind power, which are killing birds. And there are trade-offs, of course, to nuclear energy and to fossil fuels like coal. But we've got to figure out a path that has some balance in it. And I hope that, that NTV and others here can take that lesson, I think, what National Geographic has tried to do and, and emulate it. Earlier, Gary, you spoke about the impact that the photograph of the Afghan girl on the front page of National Geographic magazine had. Can you give us an example of a big impact that a wildlife documentary or a wildlife photograph has had on the world in terms of awing people, but also transforming attitudes and perhaps changing behavior as well? Well, the War for the Elephants, which uh, appeared a couple of years ago, has made a big impact. And uh, we know that uh, you know, the Kenyan parliament has uh, had an opportunity to view it and, and the ivory burn that was done here in uh, South Africa uh, was something that I can't say was completely out of that film, but um, through, through many important people working here, like Paula and Richard Leakey and others, uh, the government took action, and I think it was a powerful message that was hopefully inspired uh, by that film. And that's what we are about. And whether it's working in the oceans, protecting three million square kilometers of, in the mar marine sanctuaries, or working here to uh, tell the story of elephants, which will hopefully have an impact in areas where ivory is in demand, that's what we need to do. We need to show those films here, but we also need to show them in China. We need to show them in Vietnam, the Philippines. And that's what we are doing now, and hopefully it will have a, a much uh, longer impact. There are so many thousands of films made by uh, Nat Geo. Do you have a favorite? Oh my goodness. <laughs> or is that a really uh, tough question? Yeah, well, you know, there, there are so many. The work of Derek and Beverly Jobert down in uh, Southern Africa is, is quite brilliant. The Last Lions that they did is a particular favorite. But we also have produced films like Restrepo, um, which was covering the Afghan war. Um, and recently on the channel, of course, now on the channel is this new Mars project, which uh, appeared in November and December, uh, which is uh, an amazing uh, documentary about what colonization of Mars might look like. Wow. Um, and the messages, of course, are not simply that everyone should jump and uh, run off to Mars, but it, get, it helps build a mirror on the same issues that we are forced to deal with on planet Earth, and also the message that working as a team you can actually accomplish an incredible amount, just as a Mars mission might. So those sorts of programs, I think, are what we are pointedly trying to, uh, to aim at. And Gary, for those who perhaps don't share the same sentiments that this Earth needs to be protected, and if it isn't, then, you know, we may be doomed. What is your message to them? Because not everybody is converted. Not everybody cares for wildlife or for our environment. Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, I, I beg to differ a little bit. I think most people deep down underneath do not want to see a, a planet destroyed. I mean, no matter what your political position is. Now, a lot of these issues, frankly, are just from human needs and we have to understand those and deal with those and it's those issues of shelter and food and education and housing and you know how much is not enough and how much is too much and coming up with some balanced approach to these issues we're not ideologues and we try to empathize with different populations of people and i think the the fact is that anyone has to look their children in the eye and explain to them 
why there is all this litter on the road. And why are we despoiling uh, these sanctuaries for these large mammals? And it's pretty hard to explain to your kids uh, why, the, why that is happening. And I think most, the vast majority of people are going to agree <clears throat> with what I just said. And I think we have to focus on them and take action. And speaking about taking action, uh, what is your fear about the future of our wildlife and our environment? And what is your hope? How optimistic are you that all will be well? Well, I mean, I fear what many people fear, uh, that our wildlife populations are uh, getting more constrained as population increases into areas that they were in before we were in um, and how do we find corridors for them I think where they can be protected um, and obviously the issues around poaching uh, those sorts of issues are critical to get under control and many many amazing people are trying their best to do that trying to come up with human uh, wildlife conflict uh, solutions. Uh, I'm hopeful though because there are so many people I think turned on to this issue globally and there are people all around the world now who are focused on sanctuaries, to focused on uh, uh, on corridors, to, to whether they're in Latin America with the jaguar or whether they're in Botswana or Kenya or e Tanzania or other countries. We've got to work on promoting this and I think our voices matter a lot uh, in, in developing tourism and developing other ways in which we can promote this very important ethic. Gary, it has been a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for contributing to NTV Wild Talk and also to the National Geographic Society for supporting our show. We appreciate it. With me right here, Gary Nell, the CEO and President of the National Geographic Society right here in Kenya. So much to learn from him and Nat Geo, our favorite channel, if not NTV. <laughs> All right, we are now shifting focus. It is time for one of your favorite parts of the show. Here is our wild guess question. Through social media, how many people around the world are Nat Geo reaching? Through social media, how many people around the world are Nat Geo reaching? To participate, just like the NTV Wild Facebook page and post your answer on the timeline associated with this question. The first person to answer correctly wins one night for two at the Hadassah Hotel, courtesy of Superior Hotels Kenya. Plus, free entry for four people and one vehicle to a national park of your choice, thanks to the Kenya Wildlife Service, one bottle of wine courtesy of Wines of the World, and a gift hamper courtesy of Wildlife Direct. Terms and conditions apply. Last week's lucky winner was Steve Kebi. And now, here is our Wild Pick segment. Levis Kariuki was at Mount Menengai in Nakuru. He was taking a selfie and says that he was visiting for the first time with family and they enjoyed themselves. At the Salt Lake, this is a photo taken by Absalom Soli of his girls. They were viewing the animals and he says that some of his family had never seen an elephant, so he decided to take them to Salt Lake and it's a wonderful place to be. Wairi Muanjiku and her son were at Fort Jesus in Mombasa. They were both enjoying the view of the ocean. Wairimu says that she wanted to experience the view of the ocean for the first time and it was amazing. In Elgeo Maraquet at the Yemit Forest, this is a snap of David Chemweno and his kids. He says they were enjoying seeing the huge trees there and they went to the indigenous forest to enjoy nature during the December holidays. Rachel Leshan and her friends were at the Mount Kenya forest. They were taking a group selfie and Rachel says that they've been visiting for conservation purposes. They often try to educate loggers on the disadvantages of cutting down trees. If you want your photo showcased on our Wild Picks segment, just like our NTV Wild Facebook page and send a photo that shows you celebrating nature via private message. Be sure to include your full name, tell us where the photo was taken, what you were doing and why. For years and years, National Geographic has inspired millions of people around the world to explore and discover our incredible planet and consequently protect it. And it continues to do so. 
We certainly hope that National Geographic inspires you as much as it does us here at NTV Wild Talk. That's it for the show. Thanks for watching. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi. We'll see you again next Tuesday at 10 p.m. People yeah. here would know about yeah. it. Right? I don't think so. Do we require to do that? Like, you know, a lot of. Are you ready? You're yeah, good yeah. to go? Okay, I'm feeling raindrops. So yeah. <laughs> we... Is there any. Gary, it has been a pleasure having you. Have that sound, all right? Yeah, that sound. All right. To explore and discover, I knew I was going to take, to explore and discover what? To explore and discover the planet. The planet. Oh, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers. 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 All right. Oh, it seems like <laughs> so excited. <laughs> right, thank you. This is not airing till like the 10th of January. <laughs> NTV Wild Talk, in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct.